Welcome to the Lead to Succeed podcast, a podcast where you hear firsthand leadership stories, tips, and hacks to enhance your life and career. Brought to you by Zahi Abdeen and Usama Al Musa. Um, welcome to Lead to Succeed podcast. Uh, today we have Ms. William Keeper, and today we're going to talk about empowering leaders. Um, William uh, or Will, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Sam, good, good to see you as well. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for um, being around and for allocating the time to be it's with you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Will, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, what you do, and uh, where you're at, where you're from, a little bit of background. Uh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm sitting today in uh, Portland, Oregon, on the west coast of the uh, U.S., and uh, I come to you uh, after a long career as a uh, public and private company CEO and board member. Uh, mostly in the information technology uh, industry, uh, but as I have been uh, coaching businesses and executives for about the last 10 years across a variety of uh, businesses. Uh, and so I've gotten a, I have a pretty broad perspective I, uh, from, you know, sectors, I guess you could say, or domains of, uh, of business. Um, I have uh, principally been uh, a CEO and uh, responsible for uh, operations. I would say I, I have been an operating guy uh, in terms of the CEO of some eight public companies in the U.S., different ones at different times, including uh, New York Stock Exchange listed companies and a couple of uh, NASDAQ uh, listed companies. Uh, I have some global experience and, uh, in fact, have traveled uh, and worked, uh, not lived, but traveled and worked in the Middle East and, uh, you know, very much have enjoyed my my time uh, when I've been there and have made some friends that have uh, been sustaining. So um, what, what I've been doing, yeah, basically starting with the pandemic, I have been uh, writing uh, full-time and sheltering, I guess you might say. Uh, so in the last three years or two and a half years, I have uh, put out three books. Uh, one was called uh, Untethered Aging, and uh, it's kind of about the transformation as we go from, um, you know, working career into the rest of life. You know, what does that mean and what are the challenges and how do you prepare for it? And somewhat about the bigger picture, kind of the existential questions like, you know, what, who am I? Did I make a difference? Will I be remembered? And things like that. And uh, the second one uh, I co-authored with uh, Steve Chandler, who is a, I'll say, renowned uh, coach of coaches, coach of leadership coaches. Um, and uh, we collaborated on a book called The Wellbeing Bucket List. Uh, basically, again, about transformation, not about, uh, you know, climbing the pyramids or, uh, you know, jumping off uh, a bridge or uh, traveling to uh, Tibet, but more about choices that we can make to change our lives in a meaningful way and a lasting way without spending any money with just looking inside and, you know, working to transform and develop ourselves to, I'll say, the higher self. And, and then uh, uh, Steve and I also, Steve Chandler and I have uh, co-authored a book that will be out next month uh, called The Leader and the Coach, The Art of Humanity in Leadership. And that's how, uh, obviously you know this, that's how we connected and the, what brought me to being here with you today. Good, good. So, um... I'm assuming that's what's keeping you busy nowadays. Getting that oh book. my gosh. Well, uh, partly I view my uh, job as kind of an observer of, of life and times. And um, is we, if we look around uh, today, just to keep a perspective on what's going on in the world is uh, almost a full-time job, you know, with uh, 
with issues of Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, the developments in China in terms of greater surveillance and, and you know, tighter management of the, the populace, the wake up call for the EU in terms of independence and, and, and self-reliance, you might say, and uh, obviously what's happened with you know, oil and gas and so on has really uh, made a difference in inflation all around the world. Food supply is affected by the Ukraine. So, and, and then in the US where I uh, reside, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I'll say divisive uh, dialogue and uh, upset about uh, former president uh, apparently being, you know, found out to be somewhat of a thug and uh, so th there's a lot to absorb uh, every day. And that's without, you know, the impact of COVID or the, the other things that we've kind of become used to. <laughs> so uh, I spend my time doing that on a closer to home basis. I, I do write uh, typically 30 to 40 hours a week. I work on, uh, you know, manuscripts and, and I love to write. And then my, my other part of life is fitness training. So mm -hmm. I... I, you know, work out three, four times a week, hike and walk and, and have generally uh, paid attention to, to my health. Maybe I didn't always do that, but uh, I'm doing it today. So that's a little bit more about me. Yeah, interesting. Uh, great, great to get to know you um, and great to, that you're sharing this. And while well, you're opening my appetite um, with this very, very rich experience and diverse, you're talking about IT and then uh, this yeah. interest and the observational part of science and yeah. leadership. And, you know, um, a couple of days ago, I was in Istanbul to uh, deliver a speech about um, the leaders of the future and what competencies do we require yeah and you know technological intelligence comes on top and yeah, I, you're you're sorry and uh, you're bringing in the topic of humanity and leadership in, during the most of technological um, like circumstances context that we we live in so what's what's this paradox now if you can tell us more about it Please. Okay. Well, well, that's that. That's the rest of the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I I think uh, let, let me take it from this standpoint about what uh, stimulated uh, the writing of, of of the book, which leads into uh, <clears throat> all of that. Um, and and I think if I'd like to go back to. I'd like to go back 20 years, but I don't, I promise not to talk about every year. <laughs> but if you go back to the turn of the century, the new millennium, and you look at what's happened, what's transpired in that, it's been uh, certainly the, the fastest developing, uh, most dynamic period in world history. And of course, we could say that about each day now that passes because of the drive in technological change over that period of time. The rise of these very dominant, you know, companies like uh, Microsoft and Apple and Amazon. So, um, so, so if you look at that, we've all been forced to adapt, whether we wanted to or not. And some of us have been able to do that because we're observers and we have we have a context that we look at all that stuff and kind of put it into. A lot of people don't have that context and have been in their comfort zones uh, during that period of time when there was not only this great technology uh, advancement, but also a lot of things going on in the world. You know, a lot of conflicts, uh, uh, a lot of upset, uh, a lot of, you know, wars, fighting. And then we have a pandemic on top of that. And all of this has been the underlying uh, foundation for how to do business and how to adapt to doing business in these times. Uh, it's required more of leaders, I think, and certainly more of, of workers to, you know, see things differently, 
uh, as a result of, of, of what's happened. And uh, the, the impact of technology can't be overstated, uh, I think, uh, as a part of this. So when, when we looked at uh, that transformation, basically, to today, and then we thought about the, 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 the how leaders have adapted, we saw a, a gap uh, and a little bit of hanging on to the comfort zone of the decades before, meaning the sort of command and control, uh, the stoic top-down directive leadership, as opposed to a more collaborative environment. And we looked at what's, what's the value that we could add to this conversation. And with Steve's background as a leadership coach, he's worked with uh, uh, 30 different Fortune 500 companies, done a lot of training also, but in the last 20 years has become a coach of coaches, a coach of leadership coaches. And uh, so with, with his background and my background as a business leader, we thought, well, what if we explore this from the perspective of both a leader and a coach? Why? Be because really when you look at this transformation that's happened and the need to adapt, people and organizations need to know more about where they're going uh, and they are willing and able to participate at a higher level today. Uh, one of the biggest transformations in this whole, you know, what to do as uh, leaders and, and workers or followers or team members, I like team members, um, is that there has to be more uh, cohesiveness. And uh, what happened with COVID was a, a blunt inst instrument sort of whack on the way things had been because uh, remote work came in, uh, challenges were made to uh, almost all the tried and true methods of central headquarters and people going to offices and people traveling and you have to look people in the eye if you wanna do business with them and all of that, that all got blown up. And of course the technology then, like we're on today, you know, uh, Zoom and other technologies came into being. So we, uh, brought our two voices to this point in history. Uh, me as the leader, and I also happen to be, you know, executive coach and coach of businesses. And Steve has uh, a coach and a, a leadership coach and a trainer uh, of leadership coaches. So we took uh, some things that we think are necessary to, uh, for leadership today and looked at it from perspective of leader and what the challenges are for leaders to, I'll say, transform. And Steve's uh, voice in this book is about uh, how leaders can be coached to help them uh, transform and also become more like coaches in what they do. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, adding to that, uh, what do leaders need to do um, from your background, your, your book, and uh, as a co-author along with Steve, uh, in order to transform and uh, to move uh, their organizations and move their teams forward? Uh, you know, we call it the art of humanity, which at this point is probably an overstatement, <laughs> but it's sort of like uh, in hockey, you skate to where the puck is going to be. And so that's what we tried to do with this book, because it's not a light switch that you can turn on as a leader to say, OK, yesterday I was command and control person and today I'm a collaborative, open, you know, authentic, uh, accessible uh, leader of, of people I see really as whole persons now. Mm -hmm. So that's not an overnight, uh, that's not an overnight transformation. But what we did was we took uh, a number of topics, leadership ideas and concepts and broke them down into uh, conversations basically between us. And uh, I'll give you 
you know, a, a view of some of those because I think they're very relevant to how, you know, this sort of humane, human, uh, uh, less directive, more collaborative leadership model comes into being. So some of the uh, topics that we talk about are change adaptation. How does a leader do that in such a way that they can take the team from where they are to where they need to be in a year or two years or five years? Um, the idea that uh, man how you manifest your leadership today mm -hmm. uh, to your team, uh, how open and uh, I'll say um, transparent you are, how much of your authentic self are you going to to, to, to allow to be seen uh, leading from agreement as opposed to leading by expectation. Uh, very, you know, another concept that we could, you know, take a deep dive on, but a move from that, uh, hey, you do what I expect you to do. And if you don't know what that is, that's your problem, as opposed to leading by agreement, like saying, okay, so this is what needs to be done by when, do we agree that you can do that by then? Do you have any questions? Let's recap, you know, here's where we're going. This is what we agree. And if you have any questions along the way, you know, put them together and we'll have a brief, you know, check back. But basically it's moving to more autonomous uh, team member. And so these are all dynamics of leadership, you know, shifting over time from close to the vest, shall we say, and I want to be protected. I want to have armor on, which by the way, that was my, my way for a lot of my career. So I know what that's about. And we, we, I talk about that in terms of some of the stories. We also talk about fear because this is one of the biggest issues that come up when uh, any leader has to consider uh, being more human, more accessible uh, to, to the team. And that's, that's scary. You know, there's, there's risk involved anytime you open yourself to uh, uh, a deeper look rather than just the facade that, you know, many of us leaders uh, put on to protect ourselves. Uh, so that's another one that we talk about. And, and, and uh, another shift in leadership is we've, as leaders, been outbound communicators quite a lot and not the best listeners. And there's such power in listening, in making this transformation from a leader as directive and stoic and armored up to leader as a collaborator and a leader as sharing leadership with others in the organization. So, um, so, so we, we, th these are some of the high level uh, topics that, you know, kind of speak to the shift and what we think is required. So I'm going to, if I can take one more minute to talk about the coaching side of the equation, um, because this is a differentiator for this book. Uh, we believe that uh, the elements of coaching that are about one-to-one -one in a, you know, in a protected, psychologically safe environment uh, is a great model. And the fact that a coach you know, deals with a, a person they're coaching as a whole person. They can't just say, okay, well, we're just going to coach you on, you know, what you say in the office. There's a whole world that is presented to the coach about who this person is, where they're coming from, what's their family life, what other issues do they have that they're dealing with, because all of that shows up in what they do for work. Uh, so, you know, dealing with the whole whole person is something that coaches have, do and have done. I mean, obviously, there's business domain uh, coaching, which is not the same thing. But when you're talking about one on one executive coaching or I'll say life coaching, these elements are very much necessary and proven over decades that this works. It is more human. It's one to one. It's whole life uh, uh, tied, it's tied to whole, li whole living. And the second part of that is that the coach can, can teach and mentor and show a leader 
how to integrate those skills into what they do in management. Because if you look at the transition, that, I really see this as, as the fundamental thing, which is that uh, leaders have to incorporate those coaching skills, which doesn't mean abdicating leadership, but it means seeing people at a deeper level than just pure assets. So that's a little bit about this integration between leadership and coaching and why we uh, went this direction with, with this book. Um, so. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's a bombardment. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Pretty... And yeah, adding them both together is a very interesting link somehow. And you know, um, if we're um, like talking 15, 20 years back, most of, lead, of uh, the, the talks about leadership or the development leadership was around um, leading others, developing others. We just started to hear um, leading self and the, the higher self, deeper self. Only, only a um, few years back, and and now we see more trends into the importance of um, the leader to go inward instead of outward first. Yeah, and what you've mentioned around holistic, yeah, approach into into leadership and leadership right. development, and then here, how how do you see the um, different cultural or the cultural impact on who would be more receptive in this inward looking and what to do. I'm, I'm sure there are certain leaders who will be welcoming yeah, that approach into, into being receptive to look inside, but some are like just to have this barrier, let's say, yeah. There is something that prevents them from looking inside. So how, how do you see it here, the cultural impact, and uh, what advices or recommendations do you have? Yeah, it, it, it's ironic. I think that what development of people, as you mentioned, over the in history has been more about what to do and how to do it better, not how to be better and how to show up with your full capacity, uh, which was, you know, in those days, it was looking at, you know, sort of, and I did this when I was, uh, I'll just say a few years ago, <laughs> I was very much looking at uh, people as assets, kind of fungible, except there were some stars, you know, who needed special care and feeding, but they were assets. And uh, I, uh, my mentality and a lot of leaders of, of companies, public and private, was about the was about the bottom line. And, you know, kinder, gentler, you know, to hell with that. We have a, we have quarterly earnings to get to here. So, you know, that's all fine. Uh, I'm sorry that your your wife is sick today and your kids are home, uh, but not my problem, you know, and uh, so so I think um, the cultural transformation is, I think, just like what we do in all of life. As we get older, we get hopefully wiser, but we're also trying to turn inward and find ourselves at a higher level of development. And you can look at, you know, spirituality and religion across, you know, all uh, all the globe that that seems to be the high, trying to get to that higher level is really about what uh, transformation is and it's our higher purpose, right? So why would we distinguish between the workplace and the rest of life? This has been the great dichotomy that to me is, uh, it's, it's long overdue that that is examined. You know, why does a team member have to check their well-being and, and, and whole life at the door of the workplace? And why does the leader not want to deal with that person it, as the whole that they are and help them make a move, even make them better so when they go somewhere else, uh, they'll be a better worker or a better team member or maybe a leader themselves. So I think the, the, the cultural shift here is not away from the leader still has responsibility uh, because the leader, you know, 
they say the buck stops here at the leader's desk and it's true um, but i think it's about how do you you know look inward because the leader must transform in order for the team to transform if the leader can't model that and show that and begin to i'll say let the armor crack or the concrete <laughs> encasement uh, crack, then it's going to be impossible for the team to be more collaborative. They're going to they're going to say, "I'll wait until I'm told what to do," and, and you know, in terms of a transformation, th that's how you bring the dynamic of an organization to a higher level. So, I, I think these are this book is a little bit early <laughs> in terms of of the of the and, and we thought about putting in, you know, leadership for the 21st century, because there are a lot of places where, you know, they, leaders will look at it and say, hey, you know what, this is actually working fine. No, thank you. We're going to continue doing what we do. And it's successful. And I'm making, making my quarterly numbers. We have continuity. You know, our business is thriving. So I'm not in for, uh, for being kinder and gentler and you know, exposing my heart to uh, to anybody here in the workplace. And frankly, I like it that people keep their <laughs> keep their other lives and check it at the door because I don't want to deal with all that stuff. So it, it this is going to be a transformation over time. Uh, what I what we have seen and I looked at probably 10,000 pages of studies from, you know, McKinsey and Corn Ferry and, uh, you know, Harvard Business and uh, studies from all around the world that look at this from a, a standpoint of higher productivity. It's good business to be more collaborative. It's good business to teach people to allow their creativity to come forth. It's good business to, to uh, help people be more autonomous. And it's good business to look at them at whole person, as whole persons. So uh, culturally, a cultural shift in some places it's gonna go faster, in some places it's gonna go slower for a variety of reasons, uh, which I'm sure we'll uh, get to here shortly. Larger organizations, because of the resources they have, have gotten this earlier. And they have the ability to sort of top down, create training and, uh, and, and, and of, of, of managers is how to do a better job with this, at what pace for the organization, what roles can be addressed in this first and what have to come later. But we're sort of looking at the second 400 million, which are the, you know, small and medium sized businesses as well. And, you know, trying to articulate these in accessible, these ideas in accessible ways and give very concrete examples of what can one do as a leader to begin this transformation so that everybody doesn't get whiplash? Um, as you were speaking, I remembered um, you know, one thing came across my mind is you've been successful and you say you were that leader who's like all about the bottom line, all about numbers yeah. or quarterly earnings and so forth. And uh, what came across my mind also Elon Musk's uh, I don't know if you were if you saw it uh, leaked leaked uh, letter to to his uh, to his employees um, uh, having that same approach a less empathetic uh, approach so what would you tell leaders who uh, who are still holding on to that uh, uh, traditional way of running a business well uh I, I would say that uh, command and control works. It's worked for a long time. And uh, the question is, what needs to be done to attract and retain the best people today? And I think what's happened through uh, the, the pandemic and the way businesses were, I'll just say, forced to change, you know, almost overnight, uh, work from home and you know, video conferencing and uh, basically being more autonomous, uh, employees being more autonomous, kind of having to figure it out for themselves all, along the way. Leaders weren't prepared uh, for that. So, and, 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 and command and control does work, it, it, but in, 
where we've gotten to now is that there is value in the collaboration. There is value in creativity. There is value in helping employees make more decisions for themselves. That is all good and is good for the bottom line, if you will. It's also good to keep the people that you have because you're showing them a way forward that allows them to grow and get better and think for themselves. And I mean, honestly, uh, if you look at, you know, research uh, that has come out about these uh, issues, what it says is that people are five times more likely to stay in a place if they have some access and contact with their leaders. And uh, a lot of leaders just really, you know, don't want that. They don't want that personal connection because, hey, I might have to fire somebody. I know I'll have to coach them. I might have to say hard things. I don't want them to know me uh, as a person. And I, you know, that's that was me a lot of my career. Uh, I didn't want to go to events with my team. I didn't want to have one-on-ones. I didn't want to know their families because I was afraid. I was afraid that I would get too connected with them and then I would have to have a hard conversation and oh my God, I might feel bad. <laughs> I might feel bad that I had to terminate them, okay? So rather than looking at it as a way of, well, everybody's gonna be watching what I do with this termination. So how can I do this in a way that gets the message across, moves somebody out of the organization, but helps everybody else feel safe? That's different thinking. I, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, years ago. So um, I, I think it, it might be a good point to talk about also just geographic differences and religious differences and um, sort of equal, I'll say equal rights, you know, where it, a male dominated society versus more, I'll say egalitarian, not that uh, all of the, all of them are. And certainly in the United States, you know, we talk about that being equal and egalitarian and so on, but it's a process, you know, it's definitely a process. And in the Middle East, it's obviously you have uh, religious and, and historical and uh, spiritual ideas. And also uh, the, the, the men, you know, have a big say, right? <laughs> and so if you look at the culture in the Middle East and, and in other places around the, the world, it, it's more difficult to move from that model. Uh, but my view is that if you're going back to the hockey analogy, which is probably not great for the Middle East, but, uh, but, but going to where the soccer ball is gonna, let's talk about football, right? Uh, you know, it's leading the player and then kicking the ball to where the player is going to be. I think that wherever you are in the world, that these ideas, these concepts are going to be integrated. Maybe not in the same way, but I think in order to raise the level of uh, organizational unity, raise the level of people working in common for the purpose of the organization, that you know these things are going to have to be integrated slowly. I think coaching, you know, as you you all do, and training uh, across the Middle East is going to seed these ideas and begin to show people that they don't have to give up the leadership uh, persona, they don't have to give up control, but how about, you know, integrating some collaboration that may help people, you know, good people stay with you because they're not hostages. I mean, they can go to other organizations. So use self-interest as a way of moving toward this greater, I'll say humaneness. I think it's almost a better word, um, you know, in cultures where it's gonna be harder to to, you know, to make that move. I want to, uh, like, take it for a specific direction now before we um, conclude this podcast. Well, um, you mentioned that it used to be more into the doing part. Yeah, so leaders would have thought of how to develop their potential more. Uh, how to learn new things, how to do things different. The part of interferences, which you mentioned in your book around fear, insecurities, yeah, um, we, we're, we're more into tackling these aspects now. Yeah. And then when we talk about fear, which, which feels like it's 
one of the major um, hindrance of um, growing further, yeah, or or just its hindrance towards that mastery in performance. What is like the practical formula here that you um, advise for leaders when they face the insecurities piece, the fear piece? How how would they manage it? What is the recipe here? Well, I I think that uh, it's a huge issue and never goes away for leaders uh, because there's a voice in your head that's always challenging you. If if nobody else is challenging you, it doesn't matter because you're asking yourself, what if I fail? What if I'm exposed as an imposter? I'm not a real leader. I'm a fake leader, you know, uh, and I know that I know more about this now and I know that we're going to be in trouble in six months. So I'm working on that and I'm talking to myself all the time like we all do. And if you say that to someone and they say, well, I'm not talking to myself, <laughs> they've just done it, of course. You know, so um, I, I think that the value of a coach, an objective third party where the uh, in a place of psychological safety where these things can be talked about is very important. And that has cost me, I'll just say, millions of dollars in my own career for not doing that and trying to keep my own counsel, you know, about all these issues. When, if I look back at it, if somebody had said, wait a minute, you can't tell the board members to just go pound sand. That's not okay. You have to find a way to communicate what you're feeling and where you're going and do it in a way that, that they can accept and understand. Um, so I think that that safe place used to be, it might, it used to be, maybe it's a psychologist, right? Or mm -hmm. it's uh, some other, you know, professional that you would, you would go to. But I think that the way that coaching has evolved as a holistic practice, uh, executive coaching, I mean, all, most of the top leaders around the globe have, uh, have personal executive coaches for this very reason, because they need a safe place to go to talk about fear and talk about their insecurities and so on. So it, it, it's not just a coach. I mean, it, it, I, I believe that it's better because it's someone independent. It could be a friend, but the friend is gonna have biases, right? It could be a board member. And I've suffered with this before. The board member has their own demons and agendas <laughs> and, and so on. And they don't wanna look like they don't know what they're doing. So this safe place for coaching, I think is, uh, is, a, is a thing whose time has come. And I think that, in, I'll just give you an, you know, in the Middle East, I said, I think that this is a way to seed these ideas and the idea that nobody's gonna know that you and a leader had a conversation about things that are about fear. You know, you're, you're a trusted advisor, a place to go where all this can come out. And then you can talk about how do you take this back into your organization? Maybe specifically, how would you talk about this and do a practice, you know, do some role play? Uh, so I, I, see, I see that as a, honestly, a, a solution. I'm not selling it. I'm just saying in my own case, once I figured that out, you know, that, that, that safe place was really important. Otherwise, I'm just, you know, everything's bouncing around in my head. And that is a sometimes a terrible conversation to be having with yourself. So uh, anyway, I hope that answers a, a, a oh, little yeah. bit about that. It's a deep yeah. subject, obviously. <laughs> it is. I, I just had one today. And it was very deep into um, the fear aspect. And this leader said by the end of the session, listen, Osama, I never talked about it this way in my entire life. Right. I never even touched it, you see, that is, it's like a taboo, yeah, that we keep it, we keep hiding it. Um, well, um, it's to you now, and we want to, what was, to know what was the, uh, your own formula to remain uh, performing, and what's this formula for you to continue being a better leader, a better coach? Yeah, I, I, I think there's some, some very practical things, some concrete steps that leaders can take. So it's not just about, ooh la la, I have to be kinder, gentler, I have to, where's my heart? I have to be more humane. 
well, that's not a very, well, how do you, okay, you've gotten the news now, that'll be $450 for the hour, right? Um, that, that's not it. So I, I think there are a couple of things. Um, f first of all, I, I, I think the leader has to look inside and say, it's not about the heart. It's about what's my foundation for leading people? You know, what do I stand for? Uh, how do I feel about myself? What, wh how do I, what parts of myself are high leverage and what parts of myself are flawed that I need to spend some time on? So this is, you know, not just going inside, but it's reflecting. It's not about look into your heart. It's about, you know, look at yourself as objectively as you can. And that's where a coach uh, can help with that because I've done that with coaches and they'll say, okay, write down the 50 things that are wrong with you and be as, be as uh, brutal as you can possibly be. I'm not a very kind person. I hurt people almost every day, you know, and then you would start examining these those things and say, is that really true? And you find out, well, that's partly true, but maybe not so true. So, so, so I think establishing a leadership foundation for yourself, like this is where I sit, this is this is what I have by way of assets. Here are some of my liabilities. Now, how do I talk about that? So, so that's a, a step number one. The step number two is I feel very strongly that a way to get ideas across is for a leader to have their own charter. And, you know, I've done this for years. It continues to evolve. And in the uh, leader and the coach book, I talk about my own uh, 10 points of, of my leadership charter. And I think what this does is it enables people, you share those, right? They're, they're not just for you. You refine them, but then you you talk about those things and you 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 make examples when you're working with people. Like, hey, that's a great uh, that's a great example of someone doing what they said they would do, uh, or that's a great example of someone adding value where they can. You know, John did a great job of helping by showing a, an idea or introducing you know the colleague to someone else who could be helpful right away. So I'm going to just, if, if I can, I'm not going to go through all 10 there in the book, but, but I, I, number one is I think that uh, integrity and honesty are, are number one. And however you want to articulate that as, uh, you know, for yourself as a leader, do it that way. But uh, the, the bottom line is for an organization and for the leader, honoring your word, doing what you say you will do to me is, is the is, is at the top of the heap in terms of a leadership charter. If you can get people to do that, then you, you, your organization builds trust around that and and feels safe to collaborate together. So that is, and it also uh, enables measurement. You did what you said you would do in the time you within which you said you would do it, or you didn't. <laughs> so that's easy to talk about. It's not about blame or you didn't do this or you're a bad person it's about we made an agreement and you you had a chance to talk about it and and come to agreement we agreed we put a date here and you didn't make it or you didn't make it thank you very much you met expectations it's not like you know you're outstanding or, or terrible it's like you met expectations you know that's what we want from everybody if you go beyond that god bless them i'm oh, sorry it, it, it go that's great. It will improve you. It will improve everybody else. And that a second one that I have is to be accountable for your actions and outcomes. And what this means is the leaders and owner, right? They exhibit ownership for leadership decisions and guiding the organization. Don't you want everybody to do that in the organization? Exhibit ownership, have an identity with the purpose of the organization. That's not up to the to, to the to the team member, the leader has to say, "This is what I want from you," and reinforce when he's, he or she sees people doing those things right, and let them know what they could do better if they they haven't quite gotten there. So, and and, and I'll leave you with the the third one, a third one out of the the ten is that um, the the ability to challenge the status quo. I think this is, 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 is really a big deal for organizations today. P 
put, you know, be as critical of your own business as you can possibly be. Encourage your people to challenge what's worked for the last 20 years, but maybe may not work for the next 20 years and celebrate people who are willing to step up and challenge that. One of the things that I think that the great technology, global technology companies today have done is their cultures are built around this because the speed of change in the technology requires it. You can't wait for the marketplace or competitors to tell you, oh, wait, you are, you just went five years behind. <laughs> you know, you've got to have people inside and celebrate them and reward them for being challengers. So those are three of the things on my, but I think every leader must have a charter, must have, I'll say 10 things that they can articulate that they stand for and then reinforce it, share it, share it openly with the team. Well, well, thank you so much for this uh, great uh, interview and thank you for coming in and uh, we wish you the best and good luck with your books. Yeah, I will definitely let you know when it's out so you can pass the word along. <laughs> yes, please. It was great. Thank you for this um, insightful um, aspects and for the recommendations. I so Zahi was uh, dotting them down. So brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. You. It's, it really, it's been a great pleasure to, to, uh, to, to meet you both and to have this uh, time with you and your audience. Thank you, Zahi and Osama. Thank you. Thank you. Great day. Same here. So long. Take care. Thank you. So long. Thank you for listening to Lead to Succeed podcast. If you like this podcast, please remember to give us five star rating, share it with your family and friends, and follow us on social media. We also welcome you to send us your ideas, suggestions, and any questions. Our contact details will be found on the podcast description. This is Osama and Zahi, and until next time, make sure to remain authentic, keep learning, and to enjoy life.